will we'll find us keep an eye out for you. So Beth, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be back this semester. Um, and this time I'm going to be talking about careers in public health labs. And I just want to start out by saying there's never been a better time to work in public health. There are so many job opportunities, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the South Carolina Public Health Lab. A lot of people don't even know that the South Carolina Public Health Lab is right up the road. Um, I'm going to just do a brief introduction of that and then talk about the three areas that I oversee, which is newborn screening, opioid biosurveillance, and chemical emergency response. So the public health lab, which is on Park Lane Road, um, the, it includes both the environmental testing, the environmental side of DHEC, and also the public health lab. The public health lab has about um, 160 staff, and this is just the general framework of the public health lab. The, the testing includes the chemistry division, which I oversee, microbiology, um, virology, and serology, which Dr. Ayer oversees, mm -hmm. and hopefully he'll walk in here. Um, and then I also brought an assay, our assay development scientist. This is a relatively new area within the public health lab, but public health is going more and more towards bioinformatics, data analytics, um, being able to share our data in a meaningful way. There's Dr. Era. Um, and so, the assay development group is really a, a new area, but this is also an area where I think all public health labs in all the states in the United States are expanding. So this is just a one slide, and there's Dr. Arrow and Corey. So if anyone has any questions about anything related to the South Carolina Public Health Lab, please, um, you can approach me, you can approach Dr. Arrow, who, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, who's over virology and serology, and Dr. Corey Weaver, who is our assay development scientist. So we have a lot of different job functions at the State Public Health Lab. The division that I oversee, the chemistry division, is testing for newborn screening. Uh, primarily, but we also have procurement, we have health and safety, logistics, yeah. quality assurance, um, IT, the LIMS, which is the lab information management system. This is how all of our reporting is done at the public health lab. Um, Dr. Weaver's assay development team, administration. So all of these are at the public health lab and they all work together to make the public health lab run efficiently every day. And it is a very dynamic um, system that requires the input of a lot of different people on a daily basis. So the chemistry division that I oversee includes analytical chemistry and newborn screening. Um, there's about 30 staff total in the division. We have program coordinators, that do all of our outreach and education. Um, this is a, a very important area within the lab. We have testing staff, analytical chemists, te laboratory technologists. Um, we have quality improvement staff. So quality improvement is a big part of testing labs. We're always looking for ways to improve our processes and, and really reaching out to um, our partners and stakeholders and making that relationship better. So um, in newborn screening, we, um, by law, we test every baby born in the state of South Carolina for a variety of different metabolic conditions. Um, we test, we have approximately 55,000 live births every year. 
Um, and we receive on average around 62,000 newborn screens. And that includes initial newborn screening specimens and repeat specimens. Um, and we receive on average around 1,200 newborn screening specimens per week with an average uh, workday seeing around 200 newborn screening specimens. That's a lot of babies. When you think about babies being born in South Carolina, that's a lot of babies born every year in the state of South Carolina. Some of the testing includes things that um, all of you might be familiar with, um, congenital hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, biotinidase deficiency, um, classic galactosemia, severe combined immunodeficiencies. And we just added um, at the end of September, we went live for screening for spinal muscular atrophy. And some of these conditions in the, in the population are very rare and we've never seen them in the time that we've been screening. Whereas others like spinal muscular atrophy has a prevalence of about one in 11,000 babies. And some of these conditions um, are time critical. So especially for things like SMA, being able to identify SMA in a baby um, the earliest you can is going to provide a much better health outcome for those babies um, long term. So treatment, you know, fast treatment can be very, very important. So um, in newborn screening, we test 54 primary and secondary conditions. And newborn screening is a testing area in the state that is constantly expanding. Um, it started in 1965 and was known as the PKU test. And even some of our hospital practitioners, they still call it the PKU test, even though we now have 54 analytes that we're looking at. Um, and then we've just added over the years. Um, last year, we added two lysosomal storage disorders, Pompeii and MPS1. This year we added um, spinal muscular atrophy and next year we'll be adding CRAB-A and XALD. And I, I would say XALD, but it's very, it's a very long word. So I'm not gonna embarrass myself. Um, in the laboratory um, chemical emergency lab, this is housed with an analytical chemistry. We have here in South Carolina, a level one chemical emergency response um, laboratory. And there are 10 level one labs in the country. And South Carolina was chosen as one of them. And you can see in the map, the location of the others. Um, the level one labs, really the, the purpose of them is to be able to test for everything that the CDC is able to test for. So really, I think South Carolina was chosen as a level one lab because of our close proximity to the CDC, because really we're a pretty small state. But what that means is that we get regular funding every year of roughly a million dollars, and then additional funds as needed to update instrumentation. Um, we turn over our instrumentation in the lab every five to seven years. And that's because we have to maintain 24 seven readiness for the 14 methods that we have um, in the lab. So there are, most states are level two labs um, and, and then we have level three lab capability within our lab in South Carolina. So we look at, we're able to test for blood agents, blistering agents, nerve agents, um, toxic metals, biotoxins, um, incapacitating agents and organic solvents. And so there's a lot of capability. We have, it's all done by mass spectrometry. So we have ICP mass specs, GC mass specs, um, and two or three, I think three LC mass specs. So, and, and that area is also expanding. So as the CDC 
um, identify something that they feel is, you know, important to roll out to the states, then we, you know, bring that method online in South Carolina. Um, and this is supported by um, the Public Health Emergency uh, Preparedness Grant. And I think that even um, the Arnold School of Public Health was involved with that grant at one time, or maybe still is, the FEP grant. Um, and this is Sarah, she's working in the BSC. So we also have a level three component, which is shipping and packaging of chemical emergency response samples. So we have two outreach coordinators that go out to all the hospitals in the state and they teach them how to submit specimens to the lab in the event of a chemical emergency response. And lastly, I'll just mention our opioid biosurveillance program. This was recently funded in 2019 by the CDC and we are establishing um, due to the opioid epidemic in South Carolina, we've established testing for about 38 um, different fentanyl, for fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. We're using an LCQ top to measure these analytes in urine specimens, de-identified urine specimens that are sent to the lab. So we go out and we work with hospitals and get them to sign an MOA with us. And then they submit samples back to us. And we provide all the shipping and um, sample tubes they need so that we can look at fentanyl use um, and distribution around the state of South Carolina. And the scope of that grant has also increased last year to include other drugs of abuse like methamphetamines and benzodiazepines. Really, it's very hard to keep up with the drug landscape um, in South Carolina. It changes very quickly, but as things are identified, we look for them also using our QTOP. Um, and then we're able to look at polydosing as well. So, um, you know, things like methamphetamine and fentanyl have been shown to co-occur. And we're also seeing a lot of fentanyl with um, tramadol, cis-tramadol in South Carolina. So this is an evolving um, program that we're building from the ground up. And it's been really super interesting. So this was just, you know, a, a very brief introduction to my small world at the public health lab. But DHEC public health is enormous. We have communicable, dis communicable disease prevention, um, public health preparedness, chronic disease, disease and injury prevention, the public health regions. Um, so all of these, we work with, with all of these. I don't wanna say that the public health lab is the center of the universe. But we, you know, we collaborate with these different groups within DHEC Public Health all the time. So if you're interested in a career in DHEC Public Health, there is a job for you. You just need to, to look for it. Um, and please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about um, public health. We're, we're doing a lot of work trying to recruit people in public health. Um, and so it's, it's a growing, expanding area and we're getting ready to build um, a new public health lab in the next three to four years. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Arrow and he is gonna talk more about the lab. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Thank you. I'd like to share the screen again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Beth was 
her presentation gave a very detailed one. I want to zoom out a little bit and look at public health uh, in a more higher level. Um, so I titled my presentation, uh, Disease Detectives, The Secret Lives of Public Health Laboratories, primarily because like public health as a career is usually not well advertised and not well known. So uh, we'll try to, and you know, these kind of presentations are very helpful in uh, helping people understand what it, what in fact public health is and, uh, uh, and potential uh, career options that you might be interested in. So I wanted to start off with Thanos. So Thanos uh, in uh, Marvel's Infinity War is an alien bent on uh, curing the world of the problem of overpopulation. And so in this scene, he has collected all the Infinity Stones and with a snap, he kills 50% of all life in the universe. And that's the end of the movie. So obviously this is great nonfiction, but the fact that life on earth is very tenuous and very precarious isn't. And actually, if we look in history, this is what we see. So if you look at some of the most uh, deadliest plague that has happened, uh, the bubonic plague, for example, killed 30 to 50% of the European population. So this number, 200 million, is so staggering. We don't, we don't know what that feels like, 200 million, okay? Um, but it's just, it's just to show that these are really, the, uh, if we're talking about existential threat to the human survival, it's these microbes. Um, and you can see there are some older ones and also some new ones, like the Spanish flu that happened recently in the 21st century. And then if we keep going, uh, the AIDS epidemic is ongoing, 25 to 35 million. And of course, you see COVID there uh, at 6.5 million uh, uh, dead and uh, continuing. And you can see most of these uh, plagues are caused by viruses, uh, which is uh, what my division, DHEC, is, is interested in. Um, so the, the size and the scale of of debt and that you're seeing in these numbers is just mind boggling, right? Because even in the, with the COVID pandemic, uh, it's 1 million, right? 1 million has died. And if you add up all the wars, all the people killed in all the wars, uh, for the US history, that's 1.2 million. So when we, when we talk about 25 million, 35 million, 200 million, we don't, we don't viscerally understand how much carnage that is. So it gets worse. So not only do we have you know, ancient pandemics, current ongoing pandemics, but here's the threat. So what I'm showing here is uh, an estimate of the biomass of living, uh, living creatures on the earth. And you can see that humans uh, occupy a measured 0.06 uh, gigaton of carbon. Uh, this is, this is, <laughs> this is only 30% uh, uh, of the biomass that's occupied by viruses. And it's just a fraction of the biomass of bacteria. Now, most bacteria aren't pathogens. Most bacteria are just, you know, commensals living out, doing their thing. But the threat of them evolving and becoming uh, 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 pathogens that can affect human health is a constant threat. And we don't know when these things might happen. So this to me, this picture of this, this threat that might be posed by these microbes that become pathogens, this is the real infinity war, okay? So how are we going to address this threat? Uh, so what we have, this is the function of public health. So what is public health? Public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through an organized effort and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities and individuals. That it basically says public health is all of us working 
to save lives. So it's not just a confined area, it's very broad. It's not just one uh, agency or one nation, it's universal. And this kind of helps clarify a little bit. Um, uh, this is a quote from the American Public Health Association. They said, uh, so while a doctor treats people who are sick, those of us working in public health try to prevent people from getting sick or injured in the first place. We also promote wellness by encouraging healthy behaviors. So this kind of gives a little view of uh, the scale of what public health is doing. So it's, it's a population level uh, kind of healthcare. And this is this this kind of shows uh, briefly uh, the impact of public health. Uh, so if you look, this is the life expectancy um, taken from our world and data. And you can see uh, in the 19th century, it was pretty flat, around 40, 45 uh, years of age. But then with the advent of both basic science discoveries, the implementation, of these discoveries in, 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 in uh, pharmaceutical industry and government practices, there was a dramatic change in life expectancy just in the last century. So from the 1900s, you see this uh, doubling of life ex expectancy because of the understanding of where diseases come from, from microbes, from uh, a discovery of new antibiotic drugs, to uh, deal with these microbes and so forth. Um, but you can see also that this, this uh, the work of public health is not done. It's not, uh, the benefits uh, aren't applied to all countries and uh, there's still a lot more, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, with these pandemics that are still happening, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. So I wanted to briefly give like uh, my own career journey and maybe some tips as to how I found public health and came here and then share two short stories in terms of what we're doing in the lab that I think uh, might be of interest. So I was born in Nigeria, raised in Maryland. Um, I went to uh, undergrad at Rutgers in 20, 2004. And at that point, I did intend to go to grad school and I graduated uh, with my biology degree. And then during senior year of my undergrad, I decided, hey, let's do an MD PhD program because why not? They're going to pay for it. Um, apparently, it was harder than I thought. So, so I didn't get in, leading to a one year gap. Uh, and so I spent it volunteering in, in Philadelphia. I finally got into grad school in 2010, and my idea at that point was to be an academic scientist. I graduated in 2017, and in between my PhD, I, I had a switch. So I had to recognize on the one hand that I wasn't as awesome as I thought I was. Go figure. Um, and so I was like, okay, I need to dial down my expectations. And then I also have to shadow people in terms of like, okay, I'm thinking of doing these various careers, but what does the day-to-day -day life look like? So that, that was helpful. And then doing these kind of informational interviews with people really helped me, uh, uh, lead, led me away from academia, away from industry, and then towards public health. And, uh, and basically my criteria for trying to find a career was something that I could be happily engaged in the day-to-day -day work for 30 years while supporting my family. Like you have to balance the, you know, this is your passion, but also this is practical. Um, I took an entry position at Dallas County Health Department uh, after graduating. And because at that point I knew where I was headed, I wanted to be a lab director of a public health lab. Uh, I became intentional about my own career development. And then five years later, three positions later, I'm here. So the, the overall point is that, you know, uh, once you have an idea of what you think you wanna do, you know, theoretically we will think, okay, 
you just draw a straight line, a beeline to your goal, and you're going to achieve it. But in reality, my pathway was kind of, uh, I never reached my initial goal. I had a second goal, but I'm also happy uh, with where I ended up. So that, that we can talk more about that if, uh, if needed. Okay, now I want to talk two stories, two small stories about what we're doing in the lab that I think might be of interest. So as you know, the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic is still ongoing. Um, in 2019, there was an initiative, uh, the end, the HIV initiative was started because uh, uh, CDC and these government organizations recognized that we have uh, the tools, both pharmacologically and from a public health policy standpoint, that if we applied them, especially in these crucial uh, locations, we can, in fact, and the epidemic and have a dramatic uh, reduction in the number of new infections of HIV uh, by 2030 in 10 years. So uh, these locations were targeted for additional funding and there was like four uh, main pillars in which uh, this was to be done. And obviously in the lab were in the job of diagnosing these cases. So, um, if you look at the care continuum of people who have HIV, uh, what uh, CDC has been able to estimate is that uh, for those uh, who don't know their HIV status, you know, they, they're, they're people living with HIV, but they weren't aware of it, they're more likely to transmit that, uh, the virus to others. So, uh, for each person who didn't know their status, it's estimated that 2.5 persons are, are 2.5 of uh, uh, additional transmissions are, are done. And so uh, there's a, a great need to, to increase the number of people who, know, who are infected and also know their status. So how do we do this? Well, you need to, we need to get more people tested and we also, uh, so that's one method uh, being implemented by uh, doing home testing um, and sending out kits for STIs. Another method that we're also trying to do is using more accurate testing. So what this is showing is that this is showing the relative uh, kinetics of different, uh, of different targets of HIV in the body. So, and this is what's being detected by uh, uh, laboratory equipment. So when a person gets, uh, say a person gets infected, uh, it takes about a week, a week and a half before you can start detecting viral RNA in their plasma. And then it takes a little bit more time before antigen comes in. Uh, the CDC recommended assay, uh, it detects, it's a fourth generation immunoassay. And the earliest it can detect, you can see here, is say two weeks uh, where uh, someone's antigen might become positive. But you can see that the most sensitive assay is the uh, nucleic acid amplification test. So that's what we're trying to do in the lab. Uh, we're taking samples that were or originally negative uh, with, uh, with the immunoassay and then screening them through with the uh, um, with the uh, NAP test. And the exciting thing about that, the frequency at which you can find the positive is very, very low. But if you imagine, you know, you're detecting, you're able to tell someone that they're positive uh, uh, just weeks before the exposure event. And the great thing about this is that without doing this additional test, this person would incorrectly believe they're negative, right? Because they just, they did their due diligence, they got tested, but they got a negative result. So they're free, right? They're good for another three months, six months, you know? And so by, uh, by doing this more accurate testing, we can help identify these missing cases of HIV and help uh, reduce the number of new transmissions caused by uh, acutely infected individuals.
So that's the first one. The second one is addressing a known gap in the epi surveillance network. Um, so if we look at the example of, of COVID, right? So January 10th, uh, who identifies SARS-CoV-2 as the cause of you know, known illness in China? January 17th, CDC starts symptomatic screening at airports. January 19th, COVID is detected in countries outside of China. January 20th, first case in Washington. 24th, second case, Illinois, related to travel. 26th, three more cases, Arizona, California. So more states are getting involved now. January 30th, two new cases, Illinois, no recent travel, a total of seven cases. So the question is, if our epi net had caught all these people who were positive and you quarantined them, where did these other two in Illinois get infected from? The, the, and, and, and that's the problem. You didn't catch them all. You didn't catch them all, you know? And this was very early. And this is something that's repeated over and over in history. When you know that there's uh, uh, a potential pathogen or epidemic, you try to like identify and isolate, but, the, but our, our, our net is, is, is full of holes. So this is kind of what it looks like. So although by January 30th, there was a total of quote unquote seven total cases, that's not actually the case. These are just the number of people that uh, everything worked out for. Because before, if we look at, so this was the seven, I would say, is the tip of the iceberg. And there's an unknown number of people at this time point that were already also infected with the virus. And if you look at, consider this, uh, you know, because not everyone who gets infected with COVID, one, is symptomatic. And two, not everyone that's symptomatic with COVID goes to the hospital. Like for me, I have this belief that I never get sick, right? So I can be sick, fever of 200 degrees Fahrenheit, my skin is sloughing up, and I'll be like, oh, I'll sleep it off. You know, that's, that's me. And so you're gonna miss those people. Even though they're sick, even though they're like dying in bed, they won't go to a hospital. So however, everyone uses the bathroom and that's where wastewater comes in. So what this is showing is uh, wastewater surveillance. This is done by Biobot. Um, and what they've been doing is they're collecting wastewater uh, from over 300 sites throughout the US and then testing them for COVID. And you can see their results here. Uh, the, this thicker blue line is the wastewater measurement of SARS-CoV-2 and the kind of faded green line is the cases. So I wanna point out two uses here of the wastewater sequencing. So in the red, what you see here is you have a situation where in this, and in all three boxes, there's a, a similar level of, of, um, of COVID in the wastewater, but there's different levels of, of clinical cases. So here you see that wastewater and clinical cases were closely identified and, and same with here. But in this, in this case, this is around the January time period that we're talking about. Very few clinical cases, but look at the same amount of COVID and the wastewater. So this is, this is the iceberg we're talking about. Not many people had gone to the hospital. Not many of those people had reported to CDC or whatever. And so you have low clinical case count, but the wastewater says, yo, what's going on? <laughs> like, there's a lot of COVID here, okay? And then the second, so wastewater can help us identify uh, newly invading uh, uh, pathogens before the clinical case count. And then lastly, I would say here, um, once you know that COVID is, a, you know, a pathogen is established in your community, you can track the trends. And so if you look between this box and this box, you have a period of time where uh, the concentration of COVID is going up in the wastewater, but the clinical case is actually going down. 
And then if you look at the peak here, uh, it peaks first from wastewater followed by the clinical cases. So this could be of some help in people considering, okay, I have this policy, maybe uh, that I'm trying to protect people. When should I turn it off? When can I expire it? Well, it's better not to uh, wait for the, if, uh, to get as early uh, information as possible. And that's what the wastewater could provide. If the wastewater is increasing, but the case count is going, is going down the opposite way, well, let, maybe let's wait a little bit and see, and see what happens. So we're very excited. And I think a lot of people are excited about using wastewater surveillance, not just for COVID, but for a variety of surveillance uh, targets. Uh, people are doing it currently in New York for polio. Uh, it's a great effect. And the list just seems endless about things you, we could screen, uh, keeping uh, South, Carolin South Carolinians safe. And this is something I'm very much uh, excited about. So in summary, uh, pathogens pose an ongoing and existential threat to human survival on Earth. Public health is a large interdisciplinary and universal effort to implement policies and technologies to protect human life and quality of life. While there has been great public health advances in the past, more challenges remain waiting to be solved by innovative minds with a variety of hard and soft skills. Uh, and then I would just encourage you all uh, to come check us out. I think there's lots of interesting things going on in the laboratory. And then that's it for me. Thank you very much. Beth, you want to introduce our third speaker? Sure. Um, our third speaker is Dana Baker. She is with the Association of Public Health Labs. And I asked her to join us today because um, the Association of Public Health Labs, APHL, has a very robust um, uh, fellowship opportunities for, for students looking to pursue careers in public health. And so um, she's going to talk about um, both the fellowship programs and internship programs, but also um, collaborating with acad the academia environment. Okay, so thank you so much for that introduction. Before I kick off, how much time do I have? You have about 15 minutes, and we'll have a few minutes for questions. Okay, perfect. So I, I'll know how to pace myself accordingly. Um, but again, thank you. My name is Dana Baker. I am the manager for academic partnerships with the Association of Public Health Laboratories. And just um, in full disclosure, a couple really neat things. Uh, one, I am actually currently a student at USC. Um, I am currently pursuing my EDD in curriculum and instruction. So this is a very exciting opportunity for me to present in front of you all today. Um, that I'm not only public health colleagues um, with my uh, co-presenters today, but I'm also a peer to many of you. Um, so that's really cool. And then also as a medical laboratory scientist, that's my background professionally. I um, started my career down the road from you in Charleston um, in my internship at the Medical University of South Carolina. So I definitely consider South Carolina to be one of my many homes um, in this great uh, country of ours. But um, in talking specifically today, which I think is a great transition from um, our previous uh, presentation into if I'm interested in public health and I want to find an opportunity to start in that pathway, what are the opportunities that currently exist or that are forthcoming down the road? And so I'm really excited to share um, what we do have coming up, but just to uh, quickly explain what is APHL. Um, we are a member organization and uh, we do represent the public health laboratories in our state, local, and territorial public health jurisdictions, um, including South Carolina, um, as was presented to you. Um, to, and those are the laboratories that do, of course, uh, protect the health and safety of our public. And so as an organization, our vision is a healthier world through quality laboratory systems. And we find ourselves in the sweet spot in between policy, science, and practice that truly overlap and intersect um, when we talk about public health. And in our mission, our, we are set out to shape national and global health outcomes 
by promoting the value and contribution of public health laboratories and by continuously improving the public health laboratory system and practice, which also includes our recruitment and retention efforts, to which um, that's a lot of what my role does. And so not just seeking opportunities for partnerships with academic institutions such as USC, um, but also connecting with uh, various programs, um, even different STEM, STEAM youth programs that we have out there, just to be able to promote these opportunities to let people know that these opportunities do exist in public health. Because uh, back to that point of it, it can be a uh, an unseen or an invisible profession. But really, public health touches all of us, um, which I know right now I'm preaching to the choir and, and stating that. But I'm going to start with a talk on internships. Um, so this is a new initiative that came out um, between APHL and the CDC. And so um, this internship program, which is new this year, um, provides those who are interested in laboratory science uh, placement just to get that exposure or even that shadowing experience in a public health laboratory setting. Um, our goal is to identify those um, host institutions, pair up our interns with those locations to give that opportunity um, to explore career opportunities. And again, um, what does public health laboratory science look like? Um, and does that align with my goals and what I see for myself and my future career. Also becoming more familiar with the public health lab's mission and contribution to, um, I'll say the broader uh, workforce um, when we talk about public health. Uh, this opportunity in particular is open to college level students. So those who are enrolled in two year and four year degree programs are welcome um, to consider this internship opportunity and even the link um, or time um, committed to internships can vary. Um, so we do realize that everyone will, may have different needs if they may need a one month internship versus a semester long internship opportunity. There are different tiers that are part of the internship program. Um, maybe you may find that the summer works much better than doing an internship in the fall or winter months. Um, again, us recognizing that we've created different tiers to try to meet the needs of most of those who would be interested in this opportunity. Um, in this first year, we're hoping to place um, anywhere between 100 to 150 interns um, through this uh, new initiative. And also, um, I do want to add that it is it does come with a paid stipend as well, which I feel like is always attractive to college students. And then uh, transitioning to fellowships, as I provide a brief overview on this as well. Um, so our fellowship program has been a truly long running program, um, but we did expand this program this year, um, which again focuses on preparing those who are interested in public health laboratory science careers. Um, so our fellows are placed into a broad range of public health areas and um, in comparing this to our internship opportunity where it may be weeks to months for an internship, our fellowship program is actually one year. Um, and even if let's say you complete that one year and you love it so much as we hope you will, um, you can have that option of extending it to a two year uh, fellowship opportunity. Uh, with this, um, APHL does provide as a benefit to our fellows. Um, competitive stipend. So there is a paid stipend along with this. Um, there's also a stipend or an allocation for medical insurance, uh, transportation, and relocation. Um, you may decide to stay in South Carolina or you may want to go to a different state. Um, so placement can be um, really throughout the country. Uh, also, there will be allocation or funds dedicated to your own professional development. So let's say if there's different conferences you may want to attend or workshops that you may want to complete. There will be um, funding towards that so you don't have to necessarily go into your actual fellowship stipend um, funds for that. And also hardship funds because we do understand that life truly does happen. Um, we have definitely learned that during this pandemic. Um, so in the event our fellows do run into um, a situation or a hardship, um, I would say type of encounter, um, there are emergency funds set aside to help support our fellows through that. Um, this for fellowships um, is open to individuals who have already completed their undergraduate degree or four-year degree. So typically our fellows um, may be those who've already graduated from undergrad program or they're currently in their master's program or even doctoral studies. Um, so really we get a variety or a diverse background of um, academic experiences uh, across our uh, fellows that we have. And just to give you a, a, a brief list of what those broad program areas look like, a um, couple of these were already spoken to today. 
Um, but we do, um, or we hope to expose our fellows and e as well as our interns to these different areas, um, including bioinformatics, bio-risk management, environmental health, food safety, infectious disease is always a very popular area, as we just heard about HIV, uh, informatics, newborn screening, and quality management. And so from that brief overview, which I feel like was a quick drive through of what internships and fellowships look like through APHL, um, I will add that, you know, if you are interested in learning more, you can absolutely visit our website. And um, this is even accessible through a quick Google search of APHL fellowships. And that will take you directly to our landing page um, to learn more about our fellowship and internship opportunities. And I will add that that web page is currently being updated um, with more uh, time relevant content, including our up upcoming um, application cycles. So for both uh, internships and fellowships, our next cohort will be coming up in the winter and of course summer. Um, and those applications are due to open um, sometime in November. So we're looking more so to mid to late November for that next uh, application cycle. So definitely be on the lookout for that information. Um, meanwhile, if you have questions, um, I would encourage you all to visit that same web page and click on frequently asked questions because I can almost guarantee you that some of the questions you have, we've already answered in that FAQ section um, because many have the same or similar question. But if you go to that section and you don't find an answer to your question in particular, you are more than welcome to email either the internships program or the fellowships program. And our team is always constantly looking at those inboxes to make sure that we are um, quickly responding to your requests, questions, inquiries. Um, so we do welcome you to reach out to us, even if it's a, hey, I'm interested, um, can I be put on the list um, to be contacted once the application cycle does open for internships or for fellowships. So again, our contact information, I do represent academic partnerships, but I work very closely with our internships and fellowships team. Um, we also have another program, our leadership program, um, but um, that's typically more so focused on our current uh, public health laboratory workforce or employees. But you're welcome to reach out to me, academic partnerships, or my colleagues and fellowships and internships if you have specific questions uh, for them. And that concludes my very quick drive-through presentation because I wanted to give as much time to Q&A as possible. But I think any one of us are more than happy to address your questions at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. Have a good I think we received more information in the last 45 or 50 minutes than we have in any seminar we've had some great seminars and personally i know that i had and dr scott we've engaged with vs for you know, 35 years or so now and i learned more about the the public health the, the last side of dhec in your two presentations than i've ever encountered in the literally year decades of engagement with, with dhec so thank you very much and then Ms. Baker, I actually spoke with an undergraduate in one of our seniors in our public health program who stopped by asking about internships. And I knew nothing about that, the program you have now. Thank yes. You. So I'm going to reach back out to this young man. Please. And I can also forward, um, we just updated our promotional materials as well. Um, so I can easily forward that to Beth and she could share it with um, whomever there in the program. Um, or with faculty there to be shared with students. Uh, we definitely encourage that. And we're also more active on social media now with those updates. So you can follow APHL um, on Twitter, Instagram, if you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, please, please follow us so you can um, get those updates. Okay, great. And Dr. Fleming, this may be an opportunity for you to reach out to your multitude of undergraduates that you work with about the internship program. So, uh, yes, I definitely will. Yeah, and I think that goes for all our instructors at 321. Yeah. Uh, you should be making sure they're aware of these opportunities. We, we have over, I think, 600 undergraduates that are in these classes each year. So they're 
there's a, we have over 3,000 undergraduates in public health here in the Army School. I believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> Dr. Edward, not to put you on the spot, but a lot of our students look at practical experiences. We have a lot of experience with placing our students on the environmental affairs side of the Does your lab have any opportunities for practical experiences for our students? You should. <laughs> <laughs> we will pay yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to say if you've got that set of data that you really wanted to get published but you couldn't quite find the time, uh -huh. this is a great opportunity oh, oh, to yeah. become faculty and work with our students right, and right. move that data because DHEC is a repository of huge amounts of data. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we have worked with a number of graduate students. That are former that are former graduate students that are DHEC employees, and moving those data into publication, because that is you know that information needs to be out there in the in the, in the scientific literature. Right. So it's a wonderful win-win opportunity for right, you right. and for us right, right. and our students. Right. I have a few projects that I was thinking of now. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> I was going to suggest if there would be an interest on the parts of students, maybe sometime next semester, we might be able to organize a trip out to visit the lab just so folks could actually see the lab. I don't know if that would be possible, Beth. And, yeah, yeah and we the, have students from USC here today in the genetics program. So we'll have some students from USC here today that are giving them tours and had a presentation going when I left. Yeah. So that's definitely an option. Well, we'll gauge the interest with our students, and and, and also we'll mention to the undergraduate dean to the uh, chair for the undergraduate program and see what we what kind of interest we had to get back in touch. I think that'd be a great opportunity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, the students today were really enjoying it. Yeah. Okay. To learn about new branches. Do we have other questions for our panelists? Within the room, we're from the world of Zoom. I have one question for for you on the uh, COVID. You showed near Amir's Middle Eastern Respiratory Southeast and COVID. They're all coronaviruses, right? Is there any anticipatory screening for broader classes of coronaviruses in any of the? surveillance that may be coming forward and Sean may know the answer to this since Dr. Norman since he, he he's on line here may know but it seems like we need to be anticipating another one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we can get ahead of it earlier. So. Right. Right. Uh, right now I think in terms of public health surveillance um, you know we So I think in terms of identifying a potential, you know, uh, pathogen that's moving down yeah. in a bat or some of yeah. uh, of these reservoirs, I think academia is doing that. But in terms of what public health is doing, we're more focused on known pathogens that are maybe elsewhere and not endemic in the U.S. Yeah. and trying to make sure that we're screening for them so we can identify that they uh, are. Well, I know Scripps, they are working on a coronavirus vaccine across the entire class. Mm -hmm. And that is really, according to their head of vaccinations uh, program there, that's the only way we're going to get ahead of right. prevention is right. to have a broad class because it seems like they are making that leap from wild animals to humans. Right. Whatever, so it'd be very interesting. I was just curious, but boy, wonderful job, and you really showed elegantly there the value of surveillance. So, Ms. Baker, how far along are you in your doctoral program? I only have two semesters left. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. And Thank you. we ask all of our students. Considering pursuing a doctoral degree, how are you going to put that doctoral degree to work once you graduate? 
for um you're speaking to me correct i'm sorry uh well for me it was it was really just a goal of mine um so prior to taking this role in uh with aphl i was faculty as well i'm still adjunct faculty um and so just as an educator i thought you know i'm pushing my students to um do their very best to reach their goals and i know i've always had it as a goal of mine uh to attain my doctoral degree so i i want to you know push myself to do the same um especially with it align aligning with education i figured that's something that i would always need to have anyway because i've always wanted to be a, a, a expert in my craft i would say and be able to even have that experience to be able to mentor and guide others through their journey. I'm I'm truly a first generation student, one of the first in my family to go to college, uh, one of the first to attain uh, graduate degrees. I do hold two master's degrees and I'll be the first to attain my doctorate in my family. And so, you know, leading by example and being a girl mom, I want my girls to have at least one role model <laughs> that uh, shows that um, career projection or pathway in case that's something that they consider down the road. So really that's where that came from. Okay, that was a great response. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, folks, we are coming up on one o'clock. So how about a final round of applause? Thank you all for your time today. <laughs> and a big thanks to for arranging this. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Take care.